Hello, everyone, and welcome in to episode 21 of the Big Ten Watchdog News Podcast. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Graham Dynas. And I'm Taylor Seymour. Episode 7 of season 2. Uh, before we get into this past week's action in the Big Ten, I uh, just want to remind you guys to leave a like and a subscribe or a follow wherever you're watching this on any of the platforms on Apple, on Spotify, or on uh, on YouTube, obviously. Make sure you give us a follow on Twitter. We're swiftly approaching 100 followers now. That's that's a milestone that, that I'm excited to hit. So make sure you give us a follow on Twitter, and then also make sure you check out our new blog website, the Big Ten Watchdog News blog, is officially up and running, and uh, make sure you check it out there. We've got new pieces coming every week, Taylor's Power Rankings, um, a lot of good stuff there as well. Uh, and let's get into it. This uh, this past week hasn't been you know, super exciting as far as Big Ten weeks typically go, but that's kind of been the story of the season. Last year we had you know 11 teams 12 teams that were competitive uh, and looking for a, a tournament berth. This season, you know, there's about six that you can say are truly competitive, and then we're waiting on that, like, Tier 3 group to to emerge, and, you know, maybe one or two of them can find their way onto the bubble. But right now there's about six teams, and there's only been one head-to-head matchup between the six teams in the past week. Yeah, I think – it's so sad to see the state of Big Ten basketball at the moment. We've been spoiled for the last like two decades of good basketball. I, I say we as in as if both of us are not only two decades old. Exactly. But, uh-huh. um, the conference as a whole has been really good since the early 2000s. Uh, in the conference season, especially, maybe not in March, but you know, you take what you can get. And this year has just been whatever the exact opposite of that is, because everybody knew who the top, everybody knew who was going to come into the season playing well. Everybody knew who was going to come into the season playing bad. I mean, there's been a couple surprises. Like you could say Wisconsin was a surprise on the up. Michigan's a surprise on the down, but like they're not doing anything exciting outside of where they, where they started, you know? Wisconsin started winning and it just kept winning and Michigan started losing and it just kept losing. So it's not like they're, there's no real way for them to shake it up. Yeah. In the past with the big 10, you know, on any given night, any team can beat anyone. And that's kind of been the beauty of the conference recently is that you go into these opponent opponents buildings, you can't win on the road. Um, And this year that's still the case, but the difference is these, these home teams that are pulling upsets are, you know, teams that aren't even sniffing the bubble. And so, and that's that's kind of been the case across the country. It's not just in the Big Ten. But there's just, it's it's hard to describe. There are just a lot of games that feel like they're nothings, which you can't say for the Big Ten, at least in the last five years for sure. Uh, that hasn't been the case at all. So normally we have our headlines, um, but this week we've decided to uh, – to kind of skip the headlines and we'll just go team by team in my rankings uh, and we'll just discuss each team like we normally do uh, and maybe give a little bit more for the teams that have had some more exciting stuff. But hopefully this episode is a little bit quicker uh, and we'll cover everyone and then we'll do our predictions and we'll get out of here. So starting with the most obvious team, Purdue has been the number one team in every single edition of the tournament rankings, both last season and this season. Uh, number one seed in the tournament, number one overall seed still. That's up for debate with Houston and Connecticut both rolling right now. But first in the country in strength of record, second in net, first in KPI, second in Ken Palm. Um, the, this last week and a half, they just demolished Indiana in Assembly Hall, uh, followed by a 14-point win at Iowa in Carver Hawkeye and then on Tuesday night they beat Michigan by 32. So just business as usual for this Purdue team. And you know, now they're just a half game back of Wisconsin, you know. We talked about how they're leaving the door open. They're right back in it with one game, they can tie it right back up. Yeah, I think um they've kind of shown that after their quick slip and fall 
uh, out in Lincoln that they are uh, still a team that's not to be messed with. Um, they weren't going to let that – that game might have let them come off the number one AP poll spot, but um, with the way everybody looks so far this year, um, Purdue is sitting just fine after their slight slip-up. They're not really at risk of losing a one seed, I wouldn't say. Like, it's going to take – it's going to take a lot. They would need the wheels to fall off to lose the one seed. Their Looking upcoming the schedule, their schedule. Their upcoming schedule is intriguing because their next game on Sunday afternoon is in the rack, which again, this Rutgers team isn't, you know, super scary, but the rack's just, you know, in general a tough place to play and also Purdue's had their struggles with Rutgers the past couple of years, so we'll see if they can get over that hump. Um, followed by a revenge game in Mackey against Northwestern who beat them back in December on the 1st. Uh, and then they get their, I believe, their first game against Wisconsin coming on the following Sunday. So these next three games are going to be huge for Purdue, and especially that, that Wisconsin game. That's, that could arguably be for the – I mean, that will be for the leg up in conference play. That pretty much – yeah, that game pretty much decides who has control of the conference – for the rest of the year until the last game of the year when Purdue and Wisconsin play again. Um, so if Purdue can take that then um, and have Wisconsin fall off by one game, then that last game of the season doesn't even matter. If they split the series with Wisconsin, they still got it by, by a game. Um, so, yeah, that's the most important one for them, maybe conference-wise, but most important for them more mora morally, I think, is Northwestern because Northwestern is one of the teams that picked them off earlier this year. Yeah, you, you don't want to get swept by Northwestern. That, that would not be a good look. I want to give props to the Big Ten schedule makers for what they've done at the end of the year. There's the three-way round robin with Illinois at Wisconsin on, on March 2nd, and then Purdue plays in Champaign on Tuesday, March 5th, and then Illinois, or, um, Wisconsin goes to Purdue, like you said, to end the season. That three-way round robin in the last week of the season is just spectacular schedule making that, you know, they kind of lucked into with Wisconsin being as good as they are. But regardless, that's that's going to make for incredible, uh, incredible Big Ten basketball. And you know, I, I wish we could get that week right now because it's it's we're in a lull when it comes to Big Ten basketball. It's it's not you know super exciting at this point in the season and that week will be. And it'll be March, so. Everything's better in March. I think that's why they did it that way. That's true. You had to know. But uh, as of now, it's, yeah, I, I wish it was this week is, is all I'll say. Uh, number two, remaining at number two in the rankings is Wisconsin. A two seed in my bracket, number seven overall. Um, seventh strength of record, sixth in KPI, 11 in Ken Palm, and 12 in the net. Um, their first, let's take a look at their first round matchup in my bracket would be against, doo -doo -doo, they would get, uh, Eastern Washington out of the big sky. Um, and Purdue would get the winner of Norfolk state and Southern university. If, if you were curious on that, but, uh, Wisconsin's schedule over the past couple weeks, you're looking at a four point a uh, road loss to Penn State to the bottom of the conference, which was shocking. But again, you know, any night on the road, anything can happen. And that's their only loss. They take care of business and win by 12 against Indiana last Friday. And then they go into the barn and beat Minnesota by two in a rivalry game. So, you know, I mean, they, they were looking dominant. They're, they're shaky, but they're still maintaining – their lead at the top of the conference. Yeah, and I think this week will be a great test for them because they've got pretty much three games. They've got two games against emerging teams in the conference who are fighting for a second for a for a two day buy in the tournament, and they have Purdue. They've got uh, Michigan State on Saturday, and Nebraska uh, comes in on Thursday. So, or they go to Nebraska on Thursday. Um, both of which are teams who are are on the up. So if um, if Wisconsin's playing on the down, 
uh, as they were at Penn State, especially, and even you could argue at Minnesota, only beating them by two uh, when they're currently the best team in the conference, record-wise at least. Um, this could be a, a week of reckoning for them. They could eliminate themselves this week. And given that, I think that's why uh, the poll that I ran on Twitter about where Wisconsin will finish, even though they're currently in first place, 0% of people said they 100% have a chance to win the conference. Most people saying that they, that they have a shot. Yeah, I mean, it, it is early to say that anyone has an 100% chance to win the conference, but Wisconsin, you know, if, if you're going to say it about anyone, Wisconsin is currently in the driver's seat, you know, and if, if you're expecting them to not mess up, then you would say that. But um, that Purdue game is, I mean, obviously massive implications in that game, but for Wisconsin especially, they need to get this one at home. It's so important to win at home especially when you're trying to win the conference. You don't want to have to bank on going into Mackey on the last day of the season to try and, like, get a share. That would not be – like, that, that's going to be hard to do. I don't know if anyone will win in Mackey all year outside of Purdue. So getting this one in the Cole Center in Madison on, on Sunday is going to be massive. And then they've got their rematch against Michigan State tonight. We're filming this on Friday. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a, here in a moment. But – and they need to – they're going for the sweep against Nebraska. They've played two of those teams. Wisconsin has a tough schedule. That's another thing that's going to factor into it. A lot of these teams that are competing for tournament spots are teams Wisconsin's going to have to play twice. Yeah, and, I mean, they're going to be hungry, but I still think that they're I, – I wouldn't call their schedule tough. It's middle of the road for the Big Ten. I mean, they get Purdue twice, they get Michigan State twice, they get Nebraska twice. They, let's see, when they play Illinois, they, what did I say? They're at home against Illinois, so that's huge. And then they already beat Northwestern at home. So, yeah, but playing – Yeah, but I mean you... – Any Big Ten schedule that plays Purdue twice is on the tougher end of Big Ten schedules. You think about it, though, they're in first place in the conference right now, so in theory – the majority of those games they should be the favorites for. So I they mean, don't have yeah. to go and upset anyone necessarily in that regard. It's not going to be difficult. The difference is not the pressures on them now being the, the seven. Sure, they're one they're the, the ones they're the ones that have a target on their back outside of Purdue. But at least like they're not playing for like last year they were they were really pressing down the stretch because they they were bubble implications, tournament implications on the line. This year, they're not going to have to worry about that. You know, if they fall and they end up being a five, you know, that's not the worst case scenario that it was last year. So, I don't know. They, this Wisconsin team, I still think they're really, really good. And I think that they'll continue to prove it. But step one of that train starts tonight with Michigan State. Uh, staying at number three as well. Uh, the top three of these rankings haven't changed all year. Uh, Illinois is third. Uh, after the, the road loss at Northwestern, they fall to a seven seed, number 26 overall, according to the metric. Uh, 13th in the net, 10th in Ken Palm, but the 29th strength of record and the 24th ranked in KPI. Uh, over the past week, they have beat Michigan on the road, by 15 in the in the Big Ten Watchdog News Bowl, uh, then beat Rutgers by 23 to move up to the number 10 spot, and then, like I just mentioned, the five-point overtime loss to Northwestern. Their first-round matchup would be against St. John's in a 7-10 game in my bracket, which uh, I'm not necessarily looking forward to. I wouldn't want to face Rick Pitino in March. Um, what do you got on Illinois? Um, well, I also ran a Twitter poll on this because I was having a conversation with a couple of people that I know, um, where we were talking about where Illinois should be ranked because we think the national media has them way too high as a, as a number 10 in the nation. Um, and we settled at seven at best and 10 at worst when the season is all said and done. Um, so I don't mind this seven seed. I think you see teams that have really strong guard play. Um, and who can 
get a little hot from the line, give Illinois problems. And that's what you run into in March. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm very curious to see about that. One thing I was going to bring up is, and I'm not sure if I brought it up on the podcast yet, but I've talked about it with people. Uh, since your Harris's red shirt, right? Illinois now 14 and five, three losses have been dominated by guards at home against Marquette back in November, at home against Maryland last Sunday, and then at Northwestern with Boo Booey in the second half. How many of those games are wins if Sincere Harris is on the court? Because he's a limiter, he's he's a pest, and those games were all single-digit games. And they were dominated by a guard on the other end. And two of them were at home, too, where Sincere, you know, Ty Rogers, Coleman Hawkins, all these guys feed off the crowd so much. Especially Sincere, that would be an added bonus. Um, Obviously, the Tennessee game was close. The Purdue game was ended up being close, but I don't know if if Cynthia Harris makes a difference in those games. But that's just something I wanted to bring up. You know, having a better perimeter defender whenever you don't have a, like a guard at all in your rotation. That's it's something to bring up. I still think I think you're right with number ten being too high, but I think they're going to settle into that thirteen to twenty range is where I'd put Illinois nationally. Somewhere on the four or five line, probably close to, you know, 17, 18 is probably where I'd put them. Personally, I agree that they're probably overranked in the A people. I'll give you that. But I think seven to 10 is blasphemous. I mean, your own, your own metric, you're, you're, you're denying the numbers as you can literally see with your own two eyes right now. The resume, the, the resume doesn't stand out for Illinois either because. Like they, their losses have come to a lot of pretty good teams, but like the quality wins, your best quality win is against Florida Atlantic on a neutral site. Who has since collapsed? No, they haven't so. collapsed. They're they're right there. They're also a seven seed. So, you know, it's just it's gonna take a win over Wisconsin, or a win at home against Purdue. I think you need one of those games coming down the stretch and I think it's it's doable especially later in the season but number 10 is too high they're they're not a three seed I don't think I agree with that this team I think has the capability to play up to that level but also I've seen them play down to the level that they played against Maryland and so I don't know it's all it's all about which team you're going to get and no, we saw it last year. We've seen it this year. There are times where they're easily exploited on the defensive end, and it's it's painful. But then, whenever they're really good, they're obviously really, really good. It's going to take two games of nothing painful in the first weekend of March, and that's all it's going to take. That's all. It's, this team, that's all it has been taking for the last twenty years. If this team does get a seven seed, right? This is a team that can beat a two. They can. And if you're looking at the twos, Tennessee, which on a neutral court, you know, Wisconsin, like I said, and then Kansas, and Kansas is very flawed. Those are all winnable games. I think I have them facing Kansas if they were to win that matchup in my bracket. And I think that they could be a Kansas team, which they actually they already did beat Kansas in Champaign. They in didn't game that because didn't that count. game didn't count. In a game that didn't count. Yeah, so that game doesn't count. There's a, lot, there's a lot that goes with this Illini team, and I think they they just need to take care of business is all it is, right? Northwestern's a good team. They're a tournament team, and you go on the road, and you take them to overtime. You know, did you play your best game? No, but that's not a problem. The problem is the game against Maryland where you lose at home. They can't drop any more of those games, and there's a lot of those games left on in the Big Ten schedule. Um so that, I mean, that's, yeah, Nebraska is a team is a game you can lose at home. Indiana is if they get hot. Um, they need to beat Indiana on Saturday. That that's and then a you must. have Purdue as well is another is another game. Yeah, at home that the other games are Iowa, Minnesota, and Michigan, and I don't think either of the, any of those are. But yeah, you can't lose those. If if you want to maintain that you're a a four or five a three four five seed, you have to win all those games. 
Um, okay, number four. Staying at number four is Nebraska. The Cornhuskers come in as a nine seed in the bracket, number 33 team in the country in the metric, number 33 in strength of record, uh, 21st in KPI, though, but uh, they're in the mid-40s in Ken Palm and the net. Uh, in my bracket, they are taking on Memphis in an 8-9 game for a chance to play Houston. This past week, let's see, five-point overtime loss to Rutgers in which they kind of collapsed, if I'm remembering correctly. They had a lead, and then Rutgers got all the way back in it, got it to overtime and won. But then they beat Northwestern on their home court, and then Rank Most went ballistic against Ohio State on Tuesday. Um, this Nebraska's team, they're good. I don't, I don't know what else to say, right? They're, they're a nine seed. This Nebraska team is a team that could beat Houston. Because they on, can get hot, they can get hot enough to where Houston can't keep up with their pace of scoring. I'd say three Houston's times. Houston's whole ID, whole identity, is just we're gonna hold you to fifty points and hope that we can score fifty-one. I'd say three times out of twenty, I'd give them a fifteen percent chance to win that game against Houston. But that may be all you need, right? And on any given night, this Nebraska team can pose troubles for anyone on the defensive end. On this the Nebraska, Nebraska, team on the Nebraska has, offensive end. This Nebraska team who has never won a tournament game in their entire history could make the Sweet 16 this year with a properly placed matchup in the first two rounds. That's another thing. It's so matchup-oriented when it gets into March because there are teams that can exploit certain weaknesses that you know may not be as good. You know, you've seen it for years. Obviously, you know, Fairleigh Dickinson and Purdue, <laughs> right? Um, and the Big Ten seems to get exploited a lot. This year, with the Big Ten, I, I don't want to say the monkey's off the back with, you know, some struggles, but it's essentially going to be house money for everyone but Purdue. You know, Purdue's going to have some stress. Everyone else needs to, you know, play play loosely, and especially, like, your Wisconsin's, your Nebraska's, your Northwestern's, these teams that didn't even make the tournament last year, or just Northwestern did. Um those teams, yeah, just play freely and hope for the best. Nebraska upcoming schedule, they play at Maryland on Saturday. Then they host Wisconsin, like we said, on Thursday, followed by a game in Champaign on Sunday. Um, I don't want to say they need to beat Wisconsin at home, but I think you got to win games at home. You can't lose to Maryland, but... That that's the most important game is the next game up at Maryland. You can't lose that game, and then you need to win against Wisconsin. The Illinois game would be house money. I don't know if they're going to win that, but yeah, I mean, they're this is probably the most important stretch of their entire season. They go at Maryland, which they very well could lose. They've got a home game against the team currently in first place in Wisconsin. They go at Illinois, and they go at Northwestern, who just beat Illinois and has already beat Purdue. Yeah, These four are... games, if they if they somehow end up losing all four of them in a row, they could be on the outside looking in. They would be. I'd imagine they would be. I mean, even though three of those games are not bad losses, you can't lose all four of them, you know. And that, that'd be true for just about any team. Um, okay, number five is Northwestern. With their win in uh, in Evanston against Champaign, they move up to a nine seed as well, number 35 overall in the metric, uh, 27th in strength of record, 33 in KPI, but 56th in Ken Palm. But the net still has them at 69, so a road nice. win against them would be uh, quad one. Um, their first round matchup would be BYU, which as in, that's an eight seed that I do not want to play. And then the winner of that would get UConn. Um, this past week, let's see, what do we got? Three-point home win against Maryland, and then the loss to Nebraska, and then the win against Illinois. So, good week. That moved them up compared to where they were last week. Boo Booey is so good. He is the Illini killer. He just has the number of Brad Underwood, and he says it's uh, – it's boo booey time and just takes over with like eight minutes to go in the game. Last year in Champaign, that first half, he just dominated. 
it was crazy. I think he ended up with, if I'm remembering correctly, I think he ended up with 32 in the game. But obviously, you know, Illinois made that comeback in that game. Um, he was unstoppable in the second half. Him and Barry both were, they just didn't miss. It was, it was very annoying to watch uh, as, an, as an Illinois fan. But they were getting good looks. Boo Booey can make a floater from 21 feet out, and it's so annoying. Because you, you run the, the drop coverage because you've got Nicholson setting the screen, and then Bowie's got space, and he just floats it up from 19 feet out, and it goes in every time. He's got an incredible mid-range. He didn't miss from three. When he doesn't miss from three, he's probably – he is the best guard in the Big Ten. He might be the best guard in the country offensively. Yeah, I mean, he averages 18 points, and he went and scored 29. Uh, there's nothing you can really – if some guy scores, you know, two or three over his average, you can usually overcome it. But when he goes and scores, you know, 160% of his average or whatever, you, there's just – there's no way you can game plan for that in a way that you can usually overcome it. No, and then also when you have a night where Brooks Barnheiser is hitting from deep – and Ty Berry is good. <laughs> it was the perfect storm. And they did it against Purdue. They did it against Illinois. It's They're capable of doing it. And, you know, when they're at home especially, because the Welsh Ryan is an underrated Big Ten venue. They, they, the last two years have been – it's been a pretty strong venue for, for the Wildcats. But, you know, on the road, if they can get a game on the road, a big game, like we said – what do they have up next? They go to Purdue. They're probably not getting that one. They got to win in Minnesota. Home game against Ohio State is their next one on Saturday. Um, they don't really have a big road opportunity until Michigan State on March 6th. That would be a game. If they can win that game against Michigan State, that would lock in that this team can make a run. But that's really their only opportunity they have left. Yeah, which means they need to make every game count. Really, it's you don't have you don't have a margin of error to drop a game that you shouldn't. Whenever your second to last game of the year, which only comes two weeks before Selection Sunday is, or a week and a half before Selection Sunday is, you know, your deciding factor on whether you get in or not. Yeah, they need the revenge game against North uh, against Nebraska as well. That's on next Wednesday, which we'll have another episode before that probably. But um, that's Northwestern. Um, and then the last team that is remotely close to the tournament field uh, is the Michigan State Spartans, who are in my last four in. Uh, and they're obviously, you know, way better than that. They're ranked 16th in Ken Palm and 23rd in the net. But the resume stats aren't high. 53rd in strength of record. 46th in KPI. Um, they're a 12 seed in my bracket. Um, their matchup in the game, they would have a first four game against Boise for a chance to play Princeton, who only has one loss so far. Princeton's um, legit. They, they beat Rutgers to start the year. Princeton is not a five seed, but my metric is overvaluing mid-majors that haven't lost very much at this point. So like in Indiana State, a, a Grand Canyon, um, McNeese is a high 12. So there are a lot of teams that it's overvaluing and Princeton's one of them, but Princeton is really good. I think Princeton could end up getting like a nine or a 10 seed. They could very easily win a game. Um, since we last talked, Michigan state gets a 10 point win, taking care of business at home against Minnesota. Then they get a two point win in, uh, against Maryland, which is huge. Uh, and then they play tonight against Wisconsin, trying to go out on the road and get revenge in that one. Um, that would be massive if they could win tonight. That win, the win for Wisconsin, or a win for Michigan State against Wisconsin, is really what they need to kind of bump up the floor of where this season could go. Um, you can take down the number 13 team in the country on the road and the number one team in your conference. Um, I think that go, that would go a long way to help them kind of solidify the fact that they're going to be kind of 
off the bubble and in, and then they just have to decide where they end up from there. A road win at a top 10 team, I think Michigan State has all the metrics to say that they're good enough to be in, and they're probably good enough to be a top five seed. But they dropped the James Madison game. Just the non-conference was a weak effort all around. They get throttled by Northwestern. Um, oh, this win kind of offsets that Northwestern game. And at that point, you're looking at this team's in. Can they stay hot enough to keep winning and to reach their potential? And even if they aren't able to, you know, run the table and end up being a team that finishes 13 and seven with a double buy, uh, even if that's not on the table, if they get that 9, 10, 11 seed, which I don't think they will, that would be a team that I would just be mortified to play because you know that that team is better than their seed. They just haven't put on paper in their results that they're that good. Yeah, I think they can. They can if they get seeded low, they could flip a switch in March and just make it to the elite eight, just because they got seeded against teams who they shouldn't be playing against. They they do it all the time. I think they've made like two Final Fours as a seven seed in the past like fifteen years. It's just what they do, right? They they underperform in spots, but Izzo gets the most out of his guys in March. That's why the month is named after him. Uh, and they end up making a Sweet 16, Elite 8, Final Four when they shouldn't. No. Well, they, they're, this team isn't a national championship winning team. But this team could be a surprise run to the Elite 8 team. And I, I, that, that's certainly in the realm of possibilities. And it wouldn't surprise me at all. No. This team has the talent. They just haven't had the on-court results. But sometimes in March, all you need is a little luck and a little bit of talent. Yeah, and, and yeah, in a, in a three game sample size, if you play good enough for three games, you're one of the eight teams left. It's what makes March so exciting, and also not the best way to choose a champion. But oh, but it's the best way to choose a champion. It's it's the most it's the most fun way to do it. I'll tell you that. Uh, let's fly through the rest of these teams because no one is is on the bubble at this point. The, there are three teams that I think are trying to get there right now, starting with Indiana. Obviously, they got throttled at home against Purdue. That didn't help, followed by a 12-point loss at Wisconsin. Um, yeah, just kind of uninspired. They they desperately need a win. I don't think it's going to come tomorrow in Champaign. They got to beat Iowa at home, beat Penn State at home. They get a game against Ohio State again. Like There aren't a ton of opportunities for you to bump yourself back up into the Tier 2 or 3, whichever. If you're – counting Purdue in their own tier. Um, you don't get a ton of opportunities left on the on your schedule. You need to take advantage of as many of them as you can. Yeah, and I think after they kind of started to falter a little bit midway through the season, they kind of put all of their eggs in the Purdue at-home basket and then proceeded to get blown out. And I think that just kind of took any sort of momentum and, um, like, you know, sheer will to play and just evaporated it all. And I think they're just going to write the rest of this season off. I don't think there's much expectation left in the, in the team. It was really exciting because the Purdue Indiana rivalry, at least in our lifetime has been Purdue is consistently pretty good. And then Indiana has a really good team once every five years. And in that year, you know, anything can happen. Um, but then last year, with Woodson, you think, you know, the switch has been flipped, Indiana's back. Uh, and so there's all this juice, you know, Indiana hasn't been very good this year. They get the chance to beat Purdue at home, and they just lay an egg. You know, maybe it maybe it was a fluke last year uh, that they swept them. I don't know. I think this Indiana team might be the most talented in the conference. You know, it's, it's one of the top four for sure. But, you know, the pieces, like we said, they just aren't meshing super well and I'm curious to see because Mike Woodson again is one of my favorite coaches in this conference I'm curious to see if he can do what it takes to get this team in a position to be in position to get on the bubble yeah and I think that's a lot I think getting you had to, you need to already be in position to be in position because you're running out of games on the schedule it's gonna I think for any of these next three teams it's going to take a run in the tournament 
you're going to have to beat one to two good teams in the tournament. Um, so up next, we got Ohio State. Got their revenge against Penn State on Saturday by winning by 12, um, and then got beat by 14 on the road against Nebraska, a team that just doesn't win on the road. Um, a team that just doesn't win in January. Yeah. I, whole, I'm, I'm scared for Chris Holman's job security, man. This is – this is not – it's not – I thought that he was saving it. And, again, the most recent month makes me think that, you know, we're right back where we started. Their next game on Saturday is at Northwestern. Um, I don't like the chance. If they, they need that one, really, and I don't think they're going to get it. He needs it for his job, I think. He needs He needs to get to – 20 wins, 22 wins to keep his job and they're running out of they're running out of games to do that in. Yeah, what are they at now? Finishing, they are thir- 13 and 6. Yeah, 13, 13 and, and six, 6 isn't bad, but 3 and 5 in the Big 10 is. Right, because he's going to finish at or below 500. Yeah, if he finishes 9 and 11, right? That's 19 wins. They would need to get at least a win or two to be in the discussion in the Big Ten tournament. Yeah, and I don't see that as something that, as of the current state of this team, is not something that's possible to do. We'll see, because this team, like we saw it last year, they got hot. They were worse last year, and and they won. They got into the Final Four. They had to win, what, three games to get there. Um, they can do it. This team is better than last year's team. It's just... You know, that seemed to be kind of fluky last year, and I don't know if they're going to have the ability to do it again. Yeah, I have no doubt that they can do it. It's just that it takes – I don't know why, but it takes Holtman or the, you know, scouts or whatever they have um, to, like, a month into the Big Ten season before they're like, okay, we figured out what works and what doesn't in this conference. Yeah, and whenever he's been here for six, seven years now, you'd expect for him to have that figured out. Um, okay, and then number nine, this is the team that I, out of this group, I was kind of putting my eggs in their basket, was Iowa. I thought they could do it, uh, especially they come off a nine-point road win in the barn on Monday night. Um, that was oh, two Monday nights ago. Uh, and then they have two home games. They get beat by Purdue by 14, and then the killer is a two-point you know, buzzer-beater loss to Maryland at home. Maryland's coming into some Big Ten arenas, and – now, Kevin Willard couldn't buy a win on the road last year. We'll get to them. Uh, but they knock off Iowa. And Iowa, who was right there knocking on the door of the bubble, has now fallen back below Indiana and Ohio State in my rankings. Yeah, and I think that's fair. This team, again, has struggles on defensive end and lives and dies by the three. It's the same story we've had, all, we've had for the last, you know, eight years at Iowa. But um, coming up, they've got – two games which I think are going to be difficult for them and not because they should be, just because they, like, are bad vibes. Like, on the road. Going, going on the road to both below-average teams, so you're ex- the pressure's on you to win, but you're on the road and they, they haven't been able to shoot on the road, and these teams have played at least semi-decent at home. It just like they could lose five games in a row before they get to Penn State, and even then, that one's on the road. And Iowa yeah. struggles. They don't. It's they not don't looking play, good for Fran. They don't play a tournament team until sat Saturday, February seventeenth. So we are what? Is that three weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks out, three weeks three weeks out without playing a tournament level team. They have to take advantage of the stretch, and if they blow the stretch, they're done. Like you said, so we'll see. I mean, at least they they have women's basketball to look forward to, right? Kaylin Clark's a stud, um, but they need to take care of business. How many games? Five games. Five yes. games until they play Wisconsin. They need to be at the bare minimum four and one, I think, and that includes what? That includes four road games. That can't be right. Three, four, six games. They need to be four and two. They need to win two games on the road and then also beat Minnesota and Ohio State at home. It's, it's a tall task, but, I mean, 
the, we've seen Iowa teams get hot before. I was, that's could, exactly what I was going to say. They is, could go on a six game run if they really wanted to. Iowa would be the team to do it, and I, I'm dying on – I'm not dying on that hill, but that's the team out of this group that I'm still putting my eggs in their basket. But, like I said, it's – we keep pushing this, you know, can down the road. Eventually, we're going to have to, you know, make it happen, Iowa. Uh, Rutgers, number 10, they stay right where they were. Um, they get, obviously, the overtime win against Nebraska, and then they get throttled in Champaign. Um, I don't even know what else to say, right? They, they, well, haven't, they, play, yeah. they haven't played this week. so They should be on a three-game losing streak because they should have lost to Nebraska. And they got lucky that Nebraska laid an egg. Down the stretch. They should have. They should be on a three-game losing streak going to Purdue. Or, have, sorry, having Purdue come to them, which in theory should be a loss um, before they get to take on Penn State and Michigan back-to-back to maybe get on track. And Maryland, Maryland, yeah, Maryland's going at the door. going at Maryland. Whenever Maryland's playing this well on the road, is going to be tough for them, I think. Yeah, and I, I Maryland's knocking on the door. They're up next of of Rutgers in these rankings. Maryland's another team that I think they they would have to get scorching hot, which they're they're heating up. But they if they could realistically go on a run and end up finding their way to the bubble. Um, which we'll talk about that. Rutgers just needs to take care of business. I don't know if they have they. I just don't think they have the guys to do it. Is the issue? This is just an untalented Rutgers team, you know. And they're getting they're getting reinforcements next year, and they'll be a problem in the new Big Ten next year. But for this year, I think I think like with Iowa we're kicking the can. I think for Rutgers, I think the clock has run out on turning it around. I could be wrong though. Mm, I, I, I think I, I, I want to say both of them are out, but miracles can happen. So there's a lot of time left in the season. Like we're none of these teams are looking particularly promising, but there's so much time left in the season that there is about a probably a forty percent chance that one of them, one out of whatever six teams, is able to make some sort of run. So let's talk about Maryland now. Uh, obviously, just mentioned them. They Lose by three in Evanston against Northwestern. So, I mean, that's not a bad result. Um, But then a two-point home loss to Michigan State. Again, Michigan State's pretty good. But then they get the win over Iowa. So, I don't know. It's tough because road home, typically you know what you're getting with Maryland. That hasn't really been the case the past couple weeks, though. They've flipped the switch. Now they're good on the road all of a sudden. They get Nebraska at home on Saturday, which would be a massive win. Then they get their revenge against Michigan State, potentially in Breslin, which that's going to be tough, the Rutgers game. But again, they're, they're hot. They're a team that – they're one of the only movers up their chart right now. So we'll see. Maybe maybe they're the team to do it. Yeah, but I'm afraid they don't have the the talent to sustain their hotness. You know what I mean? They – They've shocked a couple teams, um, but the season is long, and the losses are piling up as well. I mean, they're 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 twelve and eight. What does that make them sit at? Like three and five in the conference or something? They that four and four right. maybe four and five four and five four and five. So it's. I don't think it's. I think their season is probably on the close as well. Unless they can pick off, who do they have left on the road? They got Michigan State, Ohio State. They can pick off Wisconsin, Rutgers, and Penn State also on the road. They, they need uh, like four of three of those. Two, three. They need three of the five, and one of them needs to be Michigan State or Wisconsin. You can say, you know, Terrence Shannon, Zach Eady, top five players in the country. Boo Booey is. Very, very, very good. Tyson Walker is the same. There is not a more important player to their team in the entire conference than Jameer Young. He just carries so much weight for that team offensively because without him, they are just absolutely lost on the offensive end. They have no other options. Like Dante Scott is a good secondary piece. He's not 
you know, scoring it for himself. Julian Reese is the product of a lot of offensive rebounds and putbacks and is great defensively. This team is really good defensively, but offensively there's just not enough guys, and Jameer Young has just been putting on shows the past couple weeks, and he's got to continue to play at this All-American level. He's never going to get that recognition because this team isn't very good, but he's got to keep playing at that level if he wants even a chance to right the wrongs that took place whenever they – well, they they go 0-3 in Charlotte? They Or what was it Charlotte? Where'd they play at? Asheville? I think they, they went 0-2, 0-3. They lost neutral site games to UAB and Davidson. And that's uh, that's something that you can't do if you're looking to make a tournament. Minnesota, number 12, they've, you know, in a way fallen back to earth, I guess you could say. I had them – but like the 9-10 range early in the conference season. They obviously lose at home to Iowa, then lose by 10 to Michigan State, lose by two against Wisconsin. They lost to Indiana before that. So a four-game losing streak. Um, they have a chance to beat Penn State on Saturday in uh, Happy Valley. So that would be a, a big opportunity for them. I I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they went on a, what is that, like an eight-game winning streak there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven-game winning streak, and now they're on a four-game losing streak. So the the roller coaster that is the Golden Gophers is windy and, you know, up and down and up and down. It's uh, We knew this team wasn't going to win the conference, but we knew they were better than maybe where they're at right now. At least I did to start the year. Um I still think they could finish a spot or two ahead of where they are now, especially if Iowa, Rutgers, or Maryland have the wheels fall off. Minnesota is playing well enough that they can take a spot or two back and finish at 10, 11, or 12. Yeah, I just, like, it wasn't that long ago that they were 3-1. and one. They were a half game behind Wisconsin in the Big Ten. And now they're 3-5. and five in this giant pack of teams that include Ohio State and Penn State and Iowa, you know, and all these teams are jockeying around at four and five and Rutgers is two and five. And the the whole bottom of the conference, I mean, we're only eight, nine games in, but everyone's right there. And so there's a lot of room for you to go up or down when it comes to the bottom half of the conference. Um, We'll see. I hope this isn't a sustained losing streak. I hope that this is a, you know, I hope they can get back on track. At the bare minimum, they don't continue to lose. That's all I ask for. Um, Okay, Michigan's 13. Um, This past week, obviously, I mentioned they lost the the Big Ten Watchdog News Bowl. Um, What else we got? They lost to Purdue by 32. Yeah, it's over. It's been oh, over, it's, but it's over. It's been over. They they lost five games in a row to it started or bef- they sh- if they hadn't lost if they hadn't beat Ohio State because Doug just decided to shoot the ball like crazy in the last five minutes and they happened to go in, that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight games in a row they would have lost. It's it's been over for a long time. Are you and, are you praying that they are good enough to somehow end up in the tenth spot and not have to play on Wednesday, or are you just like I? You just accepted that that's going to be the case. I'm curious. No, I want them to play on Wednesday so the season is done. It's a, done a sooner. Early, okay, a day early. You want to talk about the Nick Stauskas tweet or Instagram post? I don't remember what it was. Yes. Give a little bit of insight into that. So after the Purdue game, I forget what post this was on, but it was on some recap of the game. I think. And Nick Stauskas, from his verified Twitter account, said, these kids have no respect or understanding what it means to put on that M. Haven't felt any kind of passion or love for the game for Michigan basketball in years. And I think that that is the indicting statement of the Jawan Howard run program. And I think it is – if Ward Manuel, the athletic director at at the university – does not fire him after losing Beeline and Harbaugh 
and Bakic and Carroll. He deserves to be sent not to not to LinkedIn to a firing squad. That that's brutal. Um, I had a point. Oh yeah, you, you just sold Michigan basketball sold their soul for a championship, for a football championship. And I don't think anybody would change that outcome. No, a bit. no, you you want that championship, yeah. But it's yeah, the last three years, the last two and a half years, I'll say. Ever like since Big Ten play started, ever since we got into college, it's been at least shaky at best for Michigan. And this year, it's just been you know downright bad. And the wheels are off. The train is falling apart. The bottom has fallen out. Use whatever analogy you would like. Uh-huh. It's it's Joe over if you Joe Joe over if Joe you will. over yeah. And it's I just March. 10th cannot come fast enough because then that means we only have one game left, which I think will be the thir- March 13th cannot come fast enough so that my misery is over and I can just go to enjoying watching tournament basketball. Let's say you guys finish the year. You've got what? 12 games left. Let's say you finish eight and four in those games and you end up 15 and 16, 10 and 10 in the big 10. And then you get bounced day one, or just day two, let's say Thursday. You get you get the nine, you lose to the eight. Um, would you want to play in the CBI? I mean, I'm all for playing in whatever tournament you can. Yeah. A- any games are better than no games. Um, would you want – if Juwan was able but it to is it team, is embarrassing for the program to have that on your record. If Juwan, like I'm Howard, not saying that we should be at all encouraging settling for the CBI. Uh huh. But I'm all for playing more games than less if, for any team. If Juwan Howard turns it all the way around and gets you guys all the way to 15 and 17, would you want him fired before or after the CBI game? <laughs> I. I want him fired. Uh, let's see. I want him fired about four weeks ago, but okay. um, that is yet to happen. So, um, I just wish that we would let him go. Hopefully, it gets bad enough. Like, hopefully, Wisconsin just blows the brakes off of us in two weeks, and they just let him go in the middle of February because that's when coaching searches start, anyways. Be, that way, you can find your guy. You know what teams are going to have opening. You know what teams are going to create openings by firing their guys so you know who's available, who you can pick off. And if that doesn't happen, then it's the, – the program will be the Minnesota for the next 10 years. Another name that I saw uh, on Twitter either yesterday or today, Dusty May, Florida Atlantic. They just gave him an extension, but I'm sure you guys Anybody would, can be bought for the right out. number. Yeah, it's another name to keep an eye on. Um, and then Penn State is 14th. Let's move on to the weekend predictions. Uh, starting with tonight's game, uh, Michigan State, we got a couple rematches. First of which, tonight, Michigan State goes to the Kohl Center in Madison, Wisconsin to take on the Badgers at 7 Central, Fox Sports 1. In the game back in December, Wisconsin goes into Michigan State and wins by 13, which was you know, a turning point for both of these teams. Wisconsin now elevates themselves into the tier that we thought Michigan State would be in. Michigan State's kind of in a similar spot that we thought Wisconsin would be in. Uh, A.J. Storr goes for 22. Janai Blackwell goes for 10. And then Stephen Crow gets 18. I think he had like six boards and five assists too. Well-rounded stat line. Uh, and then the other game, Tyson Walker goes for 22. Uh, Hogard with 14. Akins and Hall each with just two. Um, and then Wisconsin dominated the glass back in December, winning 36 to 22 on the boards. Uh, what are you looking for in this Michigan State Wisconsin game tonight? Um, Michigan State to keep it close. I think Wisconsin is the better team playing wise right now. I think Michigan State's a more talented team, but I think Wisconsin definitely has the um, the better odds. I mean, they're the they're the favorite. Um, yeah, I think it's. If you can control AJ Store, 
whoever they whoever Wisconsin has that comes off the bench today to just shoot the lights out, if you can control those two guys, you can keep it close and you have a chance at the end of the game to go make a shot or two. I'm not putting anything past Michigan State at this point. They might be better than Wisconsin straight up. And they're hot right now. Um, obviously, the resume speaks for itself with Wisconsin. I think they're very good. Um, but these are two of the top four teams in the conference as far as talent level. And so, you know, we watch Wisconsin go into Breslin and win. I could just as easily see Izzo take his guys into, into the Cole Center and win. Um, I don't know if I want to pick them outright. The line is three and a half, which you know, is impossible to pick against right now. Because, I mean, three and a half is the hardest line to pick against. Especially when you have, like, the home favorite at three and a half. I don't know. That, that, where would you lean as far as that line goes? I do hate that line um, just because it seems like home court gives you, like, three-ish points, four-ish points. And that's right on the line. So they're basically saying these teams are exactly even. Wisconsin just playing it at home. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So I hate it, and I don't want to pick it, um, but I'll take Wisconsin. I think the easier choice there is the over, only being at 134 and a half. Yeah. That's the easy line to take for this game, but I'll take Wisconsin minus the points. I think if I was a smart better, I'd go with Wisconsin to take the points, but my heart wants me to say Michigan State is going to win this game outright. Um, that may be bold. But that is where I'm at. I wish we had lines for these other games. I guess I could check um, somewhere else. Let's see. The first game on Saturday, Nebraska at Maryland. Nebraska 5-4 and four in conference. Maryland 4-5 and five in conference. 11 a.m. Central on Big Ten Network. What are you looking for in this game? Um, I'm looking for Maryland to show that they want to continue their road success at home against a solid team. Um, if this game was being played at Nebraska, I think Maryland maybe even has a better chance. Um, and I'm also looking to see how Nebraska can go on the road and beat a, a solid defensive team because if Nebraska is going to make the tournament, they're going to play teams who are good at defense and they're not going to be playing them at home. They're going to be playing on a neutral site. Okay, line is three and a half in favor of Maryland, which is kind of shocking. But, you know, this Maryland team's hot. And, I th again, th three and a half is impossible. But, like, I think Maryland can win this game. I think the smart bet's probably Nebraska. They're better. But you never know if, you know, Nebraska is a team where not all their guys are going to be on all the time. And Maryland's a team where oftentimes you you at least know what you're getting. You know what the baseline is. And if Jameer Young can go crazy at home, he can absolutely win that game. Um, who thinks falling Tominaga on the Maryland side? Harris Smith? Um, he's pretty – he's bigger. You know, I'm not sure if he's the – I mean, Jameer – it's not going to be Jameer Young. Um I mean, they go big every game. They've got Dante Scott and Geronimo. It's It's got to be Harris Smith. You think they're going to put a freshman on him, though? I mean, he's their best I athlete. He's, he's probably their best perimeter defender. Like, I mean, it's, it's fine. I just feel like a freshman can get exposed sometimes, especially for a guy who never stops moving. Yeah, I don't love the matchup in general. Okay, so I, I'll go Nebraska now that I pose I think I'm going to take Nebraska as well. Okay. Indiana at Illinois. Uh, Indiana's four and four, Illinois five and three in conference. It's in Champaign at two p.m. Central. It'll be airing on Fox, uh, and the line is where is it at? Where is it at? The line is thirteen and a half on Fanduel. That's crazy. Indiana's covering thirteen and a half. Ah, uh, you th ah, really? Thirteen. I mean, Illinois at home against a bat. Indiana is not good. No, I think that that's not a Indiana. But the last two years, Indiana's played Illinois close or beat them every single time. Right? Yeah, it, but they're it, not. It's not they're, a, this is their worst it's a different team in group. years. It's a different. Yeah, the last two years. Well, yeah, this team's worse than the team two years ago. 
I, I'd still – 13 and a half is a big line. I'd take Indiana to cover that. I don't know. I'll oh, take – Okay. I mean, but, Illinois is the outright winner. That point, yes. I don't like. The, I don't like that spread. I don't. I don't like that spread. I'm curious to see because Indiana's big, right? And Illinois is big as well, but in a different way. Illinois has big guards. Indiana plays two true bigs. So, who's the Malik Renew matchup? And who's the Khalil Ware? I'd imagine we're gonna Coleman will guard Khalil Ware if I had to guess. Is Ty Rogers the guy at the four? This is definitely gonna be a game where we see Hawkins danger lineups, I think. Oh, for sure. You need height on those two guys. We'll see if because But it makes you it makes you really slow. Yeah. I mean But Hawkins, Indiana's not a team that goes quick, so Indiana, Indiana does not want to play quick. So it's fine. We'll see if, if Ty Rogers. If, and again, if you put you know Rogers or Damask or Goody on one of those on like a Malik Renault, that's a not a great matchup. But b, you know who's guarding the guards? I mean, again, the guards have not been particularly good as of late for Indiana. So that's not a super important question. I think Indiana will cover, but I do think that Illinois will win. Um, okay. The second of two rematches this weekend, Iowa at Michigan. On December 10th, Michigan went on the road and beat Iowa 90-80 to in Carver-Hawkeye. Terrace Reed goes for 19. Um, and on top of that, five other guys in double figures. Uh, for Iowa, Ben Crickey with 24 and Tony Perkins with 19 in that game. It was a pretty even game from what I could tell. The field goal percentages were similar. Rebounds were not crazy. Uh, the big difference was Michigan got to the line and made more free throws, and then they just shot more threes, which is odd. There's no line. Or FanDuel doesn't have a line on this game. I've got uh, it. Plus, it's Michigan minus one and a half. Oh. What do you like in that? I'm curious. I like Iowa plus one and a half. So you like Iowa, all right? Yes. One, yeah, I mean, one and a half. That's, that's just a lot you of these get- – all these I, close spreads are just who do you think is going to win, you know? Right, and you can get you can get much better money if you just bet the money line. Yeah, you can get minus one ten for the spread or plus a hundred just to take Iowa outright. When it's only one and a half, you take your plus one hundred money. Yeah, we'll see. Because Iowa is, I mean, obviously coming off a bad loss against Maryland, they could just come in and shoot the lights out. That's uh, by the way, this game's at four central on FS1, five local time. Um. That's such a weird matchup, right? Because you both teams have two pretty solid bigs. I'm curious if Cricky went for 24 last time. What's the game plan for Owen Freeman going to be? Because now they're running two bigs and they're doing it successfully. I like Iowa here too, but that's because I I want it because I want Iowa to be a team that is. I need there to be a seventh team in the Big Ten that's at least competitive. I need Iowa to win one road game to get there. Okay, Minnesota at Penn State. Both teams 3-5 and in conference. In Happy Valley, 5.30 tip-off, 6.30 local time on Big Ten Network. I don't have a line on this one either. I've got Penn State by 2.5. Okay. Penn State, I mean, I got the guard. Both teams have decent guard play. I think I like Minnesota. Minnesota's better down low, but it's in Penn they need a State. Bounce back. Minnesota's bounce back game. It's right here, right now. Okay, I can I can buy that narrative. I can hop on. They've the lost four in a row. This is their game. Penn State has. I mean, like they're just playing for to play at this point. Like <laughs> they have no shot at doing anything. I don't think. Um, it's just for Mike Rhodes to get settled and to figure out who his guys are. Minnesota, like Ben Johnson's playing for his job. I'll, I'll take Minnesota. Uh, okay, and then the nightcap, part of the doubleheader on Big Ten Network at 7.30 p.m. Northwestern gets another home game hosting Ohio State. Do you have a line on that one? Yes, it is Northwestern by a one and a half. One and a half is very small, and I think I – think I wouldn't bet on this game because I think Ohio State's going to come out with something. 
I think they will. I think Northwestern, they've kind of they've been up and down at times this year, right? They win big games, they lose games they shouldn't. This could be a game that they drop, and Ohio State gets right back in the narrative as well. This is an Ohio State game in January. Give no, me the cats. Is it, oh, it is in January. Give me but the cats. But it's the tail end. It's the t- maybe they're going to turn it around. Give me the cats. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, if I were betting, I'd bet on Northwestern. But I, I certainly see a world where Ohio State wins this game. Um, and then Purdue Rutgers in the rack. Rutgers two and five in conference. It's at noon. It'll be a one p.m. local tip on Fox as well. Probably leading in to well, there's probably another game in between that game and the the NFC championship. Um, you have a line on Rutgers Purdue, or is that one nope, too far? No, I out? can't see Sundays. Okay, I'm gonna say Purdue's favored by nine and a half. I was gonna say probably ten. Yeah, that's that's fair. I think they'll cover. They're they're playing their best ball right now. I think. I mean, I, I mean, definitely think they will too. In Maui. You can say no, this will be the lead-in game. The first game is at 3 o'clock. Yeah, but the, th- the 3 o'clock game is on CBS, right? Oh, right, yes, okay, yes. Right. So, but, will they, but will they want to schedule over it? Another game in between it? I don't know. What's the schedule look like? CBS, that's a good question for not while we're live. Not on the floor. Um, yeah, I think Purdue. Edie and Cliff is always fun. Uh, Cliff so long, you know, Great wingspan, strong, but I think Edie is probably – I think Cliff's going to do a great job guarding Zach Edie, and Zach Edie is going to have about 34 points and 22 rebounds. There's uh, not another game on Fox. No, 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 no. Oh, on Fox? Okay. Yeah. What, what do you think they're airing in during that? Just like the pregame stuff? Must be. Okay. So, yeah, Purdue moves to 8-2 and two in conference. Wisconsin – Maybe eight and one. Illinois in the rear view at six and three. Northwestern could be right there as well. Um, and then Michigan State and Nebraska are kind of knocking on the door of of the double bye. Those are the six teams, right? As of today, January twenty sixth, I am saying those are the six teams. I've got All a Twitter six... poll that'll be coming out on Sunday. How many teams did the Big Ten have after? All of Saturday's games, which um, I've got four, five, six, or seven or more. It's six. And six is the answer. It could be five. It could be six. It probably will be nothing else. Yeah. Michigan I mean, State could fall off, and it could just be five. I don't see Michigan State falling off. I think it's one of Northwestern or Nebraska could fall off. I think Michigan State, they've hit their lull. I think regardless of what they do, if they keep playing at this like trotting along level and they end up at 10 and 10 in conference, even with the weak non-conference, I still think that they're a tournament team. They they won't be any higher than a than an 11 or 12, but they're still in because they're 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 good enough to be. It would take one of the other teams to fall off. All right, those are all the games for the week. Let's uh let's wrap it up uh with I don't know if Rostin broke it but of the official announcement that next year 18 teams in the Big 10 15 teams in the Big 10 tournament I hate it you hate it let's talk about it Okay it's the dumbest decision I've ever heard First of all you can't be a conference and then say oh no not every team gets a chance at the conference title That's just against all logical reasoning. And second, how in the hell did they pick 15 teams? 15 is is such an odd number because I I tweeted to someone who was responding. They were like, why 15? I was like, well, it would make sense if you're doing a single buy and you just want the outright winner to have a buy to the next round. But uh, you can't play eight games in one day, you know? So... That would make no sense either. That's why we have the double buy system. You know, all these, I mean, I guess if you're playing in, you know, the Timberwolves or the Pacers or the Bulls arena, right, there are, are other things that are being scheduled in Gainbridge or United Center or wherever. But 
just institute a triple buy. You know, you have you have four teams. You can have play. the WCC conference. No, see you know that that saying? would take way too long. <laughs> that is with with eighteen teams that would take too long. But you already have a night where just two games are being played. Just move that to Tuesday instead of Wednesday, right? You have fifteen through eighteen play, and then you have nine through sixteen, and then you have five through twelve, and then you have one through eight. You know, and then you go on. That's I mean that's almost a full week. And I get it. If you want to do one site, maybe do it in Indianapolis. If that's where it should be every year, right? Correct. If you can't get Gainbridge for the whole week, you know, schedule the Tuesday night games at Hinkle. Yes, Hinkle is a fine. Like, yeah, it's a fine arena, and Butler's not going to be using it because they're going to be in St. Louis. Yeah, I mean, if if those are the four worst teams in the conference played at IUPUI, it doesn't really matter. Just these games, like. Why would the Big Ten turn down more money to have these extra three games? And more games I don't, I don't get, get the most yeah. exciting part of the year. And they're gonna you argue could, that it's oh it's if you're if you're you can't be that bad and like earn a right to play more games, which is stupid. I've heard that argument online and it's dumb. That's an argument. I mean, like, is that argument valid? Maybe, but I you should have to earn your way, but also like that's the, what that's the whole point of March, right? Every team comes into their conference tournament with a chance to to win it, to win the whole thing. All 363 teams have the ability to play their way into the tournament, right? right. And that's and, what makes it fun. And there's also there's also they're sticking to only 20 league games. So with 18 teams, you're playing three teams twice, everybody else once. So you that's if you play everybody. There could be teams yeah. you don't play that you end up tied with, and some tiebreaker means that they get to go off and play in the tournament, and you don't. The tiebreaker is the your record against the best team in the conference. If there's if the head to head is tied, then it moves to your record against the number one team, and then your record against the number two team, and so on until until there's a break somewhere. Right, which is dumb because some. Well, how is it going to work then if they decide that you don't play somebody and somebody's zero and zero and somebody's zero and one against the third best team in the league? That's true. I don't know. I think then, I don't know if that would make a difference. The the difference then, is you you both played the the third to best team in the league, but since you only get to play them once, someone went, played them at home and someone played them on the road and you beat them at home, right? That's not fair. Yeah, I hundred I hundred percent agree. So I, I hate the I hate the leaving out aspect. It just makes it it causes too many problems. Yeah, I agree. I I'm always going to be in all these other sports, they're expanding the playoffs and I hate it. And I don't want them to expand the tournament. But every team that's what makes March Madness so much fun, is that every team has the opportunity to play their way in, like I said. Why well, I don't understand limiting games in the conference tournament. This would only require adding two more three. games. It'd be three more correct? games. It'd be three more they, games because you, you'd have the two, you'd have the 16-17 the and the 15-18, and then the winner of the 16-17 would play the nine. Who so would you could play them on line. Wednesday anyways because you already play only two games on Wednesday. You only play the 13-14 and 11-12. Tw- yeah. So, so and and but, then the next day you're playing five games. So you can play four games and then play five and then play, or however many. I don't know if you could. I don't know if you, could, I don't know if you could do five, just because someone would be playing two in one day. Right, because that's the whole point of the of the double buys. So that way you have four games and eight teams playing every day. So. Right, right but but you're only playing two games on Wednesday. So just add the the you, extra you two add, games, and you're only playing four games. And you play four and four and four and four and two and one. So what this what the new one would do is it would add, it's going to add a third game to Wednesday, is what the fifteen team would do. So it'll add an extra four games on top of the current structure, extra three games to the new one. The only difference with the new one is the ten seed does not. No, get a the, well you anymore. could just make a triple buy then. That's what I I mean. You make a triple buy, and then you only have to add two games on Wednesday. Well, two games on Tuesday, and then add two games on 
Yeah, two games on Tuesday and then two games on Wednesday. And it's not like if you're worried about these teams, like your higher seeds being protected, the, these teams are starting their tournament on Tuesday. They wouldn't even get to Friday. There's no way that happens, right? If you're able to win six games in six days, then you, you shake should, their hand. You, you shake should, their hand and tell them good job, and you, you should, send them to they, the tournament. They, they earn their way to the tournament. Yeah, right. Exactly. If if you if you go six and fourteen in Big Ten play, and then you win six games in six days, you've earned your way into the tournament. Period. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. One of the things that we that we agree on, uh, and it's a a travesty to all the bad Big Ten teams uh, that are gonna have their oh how they nearly pulled it dashed. off last year. They nearly pulled it off last year. Ohio State, yeah. I mean, they they very sucked easily... and sucked and sucked, and then they were within like it was a close game. They were within I mean, like yeah. eight points of if they... playing for a chance against Purdue in the Big Ten title game. Well, no, they played Purdue in the in the semis. They then whoever was on the bottom. Yeah, they would have played Penn State if they would have beat Purdue. If they would have ended like up a five seed. If they would have ended up getting. The twelve instead of the thirteen, or no? If they would end up getting the fourteen instead of the thirteen, and they were on the other side of the bracket, they very easily could have beat Indiana and Penn State with how they were playing, and they could have got to the title game against Purdue. And then they were forty minutes from making the tournament, yeah. Even though they were off, we'll see. the The good news, though, the good news is that you're not really going to have to worry about, um about any of us not making it because the new Pac-12 teams are going to stink. Outside of Oregon. That is true. That is true. Right? They're going mean, to suck. You, UCLA is awful this year. Yeah, but they're UC- not usually. So, yeah, I wouldn't, so I wouldn't say this is a trend yet. USC is probably not going to end up being there either. Washington, I'm trying to think. If I'm looking at it this year, it would probably be UCLA, USC. Would USC be left out? UCLA, Penn State, and either USC or Michigan would be the three teams that get left out. If 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 they were doing it that style this year. So I don't know. I just it just seems wrong that you can be a conference and then be like, oh sorry, we actually have like an invitational only tournament at lower levels to have a chance at our title. At low major schools that, you know, if you can't get a venue for the full week, like I understand it if you, like the Sun Belt has 14 teams. I don't know if all 14 make it to the tournament. The The Colonial has, I think, 14 teams. I don't know if they all make it. I understand that. But the Big Ten, those teams are good enough to at least warrant, like the Big Ten has enough money to where they can they can get an extra day. And like I said, if it needs to be moved to, Hinkle, or if they did in Chicago and they need to move it to Wintrust or somewhere else that's not the United Center. Like, there there are other venues available in all these cities, right? Even Minnesota could host if it was in Minneapolis, right? They could play mm-hmm. it in the barn. Like, there are options, okay? And I'm sure, I'm sure we'll see a Big Ten tournament in L.A. soon. In Vegas, probably. Mm, I don't know. I, I mean, definitely L.A., right? Because you have the two LA teams, maybe both. It's just wrong. It just needs to be in Indianapolis every single year. Like I'm fine with Chicago. Indianapolis would be. It should be two years. It should be every five years. Should be three years in Indy, one year in Chicago, and then, or no, I'll say every ten years. Six times in Indy, three times in Chicago, one time somewhere else. Whether it's Brooklyn, DC. Minneapolis, LA, right? I feel like that's representative of the conference pretty, pretty fairly. All right, that that'll do it. That that's enough talk about that. Um, yeah, and that's it for this episode seven of the new season, episode twenty one overall of the Big Ten Watchdog News podcast. Do you have anything else for? I do the final plugs and wrap it up. All the Twitter, the, um, the Big forward. Ten power rankings come out on Sunday exclusively there. I'll start posting my bracket, too, on Twitter at least. If we if we can't figure out a way to get it up um, on the website, which I think we'll – I'm still going to try and figure that out. 
definitely on Twitter if it's not there. So follow us there. Check out the new blog. Follow us. Uh, like and subscribe this video. Uh, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. We appreciate your support. Um, and we will see you next week uh, where hopefully we have some more to talk about. And it'll still take us an hour and 15 like it does every time. Uh, thank you guys. And we'll see you in the next one. Oh. I can't stop recording.